Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show for Monday, November 18th, 2019. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. Show notes will be over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash 34. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have millennials turning to astrology, Amazon suing over Jedi, and liquid diarrhea. But first... Back in July, Cleveland County Judge Thad Bachman found that the drug maker Johnson & Johnson owed Oklahoma $572 million for the company's role in fueling the opioid crisis. But later, the judge acknowledged that he'd made a $107 million error. That's quite an error. It's quite an error. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Didn't anyone double check his math? Nope. Calculating that first decision. I acknowledge that the, the computing error contained in my August 26th judgment. That will be the last time I use that calculator. He fixed that oh today, my. changing the award to $465 million. He also denied J&J's request to lower the award even more, and he appeared to rule out the possibility of annual awards. Miscalculation, according to the New York Times, came from when he was assessing various costs to the state to deal with addiction and prevention issues stemming from opioids. In his August order, Judge Bachman listed the yearly price to train Oklahoma birthing hospitals to evaluate infants with opioids in their systems at $107,683,000. The amount was actually $107,683. So that is added three zeros and yeah. threw off the calculations and that's quite a quite a difference. Yeah, I'm surprised the training is so cheap. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. even if you read farther in the New York Times article, it's saying don't count too much on these payouts and all this because oh, there's boy. you know these they're sent all these. It's just where's this money going to come from? Yeah, well, <laughs> ultimately the patients, I guess. Yeah, and drug costs, but yep. <laughs> CNBC Television: Amazon challenges Pentagon's ten billion dollar cloud computing contract. Amazon is now formally protesting that $10 billion Jedi cloud computing contract that the Defense Department had awarded to Microsoft. Amazon confirmed that it filed a preliminary notice on Friday in federal court. It's not clear when the next step will be taken, but in a statement, Amazon Web Services said that federal procurements must be handled objectively and in a manner that is free from political influence. It's said oh, the Jedi boy. evaluation. Yeah, oh, yeah. Federal procurement. <laughs> uh oh. Ding, ding process contained clear deficiencies, errors, and unmistakable bias, and it's important that these matters be examined and rectified. Now, Amazon had long been considered the frontrunner for this contract, but of course, President Trump is no fan of Jeff Bezos, often personally attacking him by name over Twitter, and there have been multiple news reports that the White House was concerned that the deal would go to Amazon and wanted it to be scrutinized. Meanwhile, Defense Secretary Mark Esper had to recuse himself from the selection process because his son works at IBM, a competitor. Ooh, oh, now, yeah. Guys, Amazon starting a legal challenge in federal court over this major contract. Oh, oh. <laughs> so as a big procurement expert, Robert, professional, how, not professional, an expert, professional, professional, excuse not me, an expert. how might, <laughs> uh, how do they even go about awarding such large contracts? Because I, mean, I assume, it, well, if Amazon's making these claims, <laughs> they probably have a case to be made because it's not hard to pick, poke apart holes in procurements. It's relatively <laughs> easy. Uh-oh. And I'm sure... Yeah, it's it's sad for Microsoft because they might lose out on the deal. You know, I was thinking, oh yeah, Microsoft might actually get a good contract. Go yeah. Microsoft! Because everyone thought Amazon was going to get this contract. Amazon thought they were going to get this contract. Yeah. So when they did ten billion dollars, yeah, Amazon's going to go for it. Yeah, it makes sense. But I'm not sure how I feel about either company getting that contract. <laughs> well. <laughs> well. Uh. IEN Magazine, Engineering by Design. These toilets will know everything about you. Researchers from the University of Wisconsin and the Mortgage Institute for Research is working on a proof of concept smart toilet that would analyze your urine to keep tabs on your health. Metabolites in the urine have known associations with 600 human conditions. Everything from diabetes to cancer. Your pee knows everything about your eating habits to exercise, oh. as well as the medications you use, and even sleep quality. Yeah, your pee Dude, knows a lot about you. Not good. Your pee knows a lot about you. <laughs> the team conducted a pilot study. Professor Joshua- On themselves, the two. Oh, yeah, boy. They did a pilot study on themselves. Joshua Kuhn and data scientist Ian Miller analyzed 110 samples collected over a 10-day period and found that it tracked everything from coffee and alcohol consumption to when they took Tylenol. 
The Kuhn Research Group is now designing a toilet that will incorporate a portable mass spectrometer that can recognize the user and process samples. They say oh my it's gosh. a bit Rube Goldberg-like, but functional and they plan to install the toilet in their research facility. Kuhn believes that the smart toilet concept could have major health implications for the global population. You know, I, I understand the good intentions, but when is enough enough? Sounds like an expensive toilet. Yeah, plus I think everyone's going to turn into hypochondriacs <laughs> analyzing everything. Every little aspect. Of, <laughs> like yeah. looking at your data. Jeez, what did I eat today? Yep. Ah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Plus, who's going to get that information? That's, yeah. And then they're going to be tracking your habits. These, and it's it's, it's, it's going to be a number. It'll be a number. Oh. It's all numbers. That's yeah. what the health, the health fitness tracking apps, it's all numbers, score. Yeah, good. Good color. Good, good yeah. green heart, whatever it is. Yeah. And they'll, they'll probably give you little rewards and incentives, too. Yeah. Unlockables. Ugh. <laughs> CBS This Morning, Millennials Turn to Astrology to Combat Stress. To Zodiac-inspired yoga, even plants best suited for your sign. It seems like astrology is everywhere. I started following astrology because I was having a rough time, and I was like, um, what's going on in the stars? <laughs> that is not a good reason. Yeah. Even she laughs about her reason. The dawning of once embraced by the flower children of the 1960s and 70s, astrology now has a growing mass appeal among another generation. We have a book that dissects relationships between signs. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, relationship between <laughs> signs. It's really important. Oh, man, I forgot. I forgot to check the sign of the last person I dated. Oh, no. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> more stress and less certainty about their future than any generation before them. They're also less religious than any generation before ah. them. So they are looking for guidance. Just yeah, they're see, looking for religion. I was <laughs> just wondering how that correlated. Yeah. It, how is this any different from religion, though? It's, <laughs> it's just as crazy, in my opinion. <laughs> Nika Pels is Cosmopolitan Magazine's editor-in-chief. Nine pages? Nine pages. It's 10% of the whole magazine. In the years past, astrology was always something that you found at the back of a magazine. Four or five sentences. <laughs> mm -hmm. What's changed? The appetite from our audience for astrology content is huge. 74% of my readers have told me that they are, quote, obsessed with astrology. 74%. 74% and 72% check their horoscope every day. And millennials aren't just reading horoscopes. Oh they're learning their birth charts, which explain the position of all planets at the moment someone is born. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know... Can we please just stop blaming Mars being in retrograde it's, or whatever? It's for... just people finding ways to sell you crap. Yeah. It's just another cash grab. It's... And these kids are looking to religion now. Apparently, they're looking to the stars. Yeah. Instead of looking to church or... <sighs> well, it's funny because those same people will denounce religious people yeah. usually. Yeah. But then but... they're going off and about their astrology. Well, what's, <laughs> what sign are you? What does it matter? Yeah. What, what? That doesn't... It's... <sighs> Maybe because it feels almost like a science because it's stars and, you know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe people get astrology and astronomy mixed up. I've very, thought that. Very different. I've thought that. CBS Evening News, CDC report warns of two new potential deadly superbugs. E. diff caused nearly a quarter of a million hospitalizations and at least 12,800 deaths in 2017. It's one of five antibiotic-resistant urgent threats identified in today's report. Two of them were newly added since 2013. One, the fungus Candida auris, wasn't even on the CDC's oh, radar five years ago. But there's some good news in today's report. Since 2013, there has been an 18% drop in deaths from all types of antibiotic-resistant infections. It's not just new antibiotics that we need. We also need new vaccines, new diagnostics, and other new tools to help doctors better treat their patients or better prevent infections in the first place. That's good. The superbug candidate Aris, which we covered on Healthy Talk Show. Yeah, this is... Fungus. Always been predicted that yep. things will evolve and get stronger. That it fungus, happens. So it's yeah. Nasty. That is. Or, yeah. that's, that's part of why we drink our kefir. <laughs> kefir is good for you. You got to yeah. have that good bacteria to keep out the fungus. We're going to do a special on kefir. <laughs>
maybe over Thanksgiving. NBC News landmark study could change how stable heart disease is treated. This is big news. The study is the largest of its kind, following over 5,000 patients in 37 countries. Were you surprised by the results? Yes, I was surprised by the results. All patients were given routine heart drugs like statins and aspirin and healthy lifestyle suggestions. Half had an additional intervention, a stent or bypass surgery. Dr. Judith Hockman led the study. It's been thought that if you have narrowings in your coronary arteries, you would do better if the narrowings were opened or bypassed. But the results prove that just taking drugs is as beneficial as a surgically implanted stent. Statins are the miracle drug. Amazing drug. (laughs) Statins are the miracle drug. Well, the study does seem uh, like it was pretty well done. So ischemia. (laughs) Ischemia. Ischemia was the name of the study, and that's what the, the condition they were studying. So ischemia is reduced blood flow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like how the New York Times specific- specifically said that the participants in ischemia were not experiencing a heart attack, like Senator Bernie Sanders. Huh. They had to throw that in Yikes. there. Yikes. Nor did they have the blockages of the left main coronary artery, two situations in which opening arteries with stents can be life-saving. But these are just some patients with narrow arteries. So it kind of makes sense how the drugs would probably be just as effective. Mm-hmm since they're trying to predict where you're going to get your next heart attack, but the drugs just kind of reduce your overall yeah, risk. That makes sense. Yeah. Instead of them. Yeah. But of course you still need those stents, stents for a, a, a massive heart attack. Yeah. I, that's what I was curious about. But if you read the headlines on this, don't get confused. Friends. Yeah. Don't get confused. Yeah. Cause it wasn't fully blocked. <laughs> that was yeah. the key. Yep. A little misleading with that title. Exactly. Moving on to war news, Democracy Now!, War on Terror, Death Toll. New research finds the so-called War on Terror launched by the Bush administration after the 9-11 attacks has left over 800,000 people dead at a cost of $6.4 trillion. $6.4 trillion. A lot of people did. And a pair of reports published this week by the Cost of War Project at Brown University— Researchers warn the true death toll is much higher once indirect deaths are factored in. Writing in The Hill, Professor David Vine argues, quote, This means that total deaths during the post-2001 U.S. wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Pakistan, and Yemen is likely to reach 3.1 million or more, around 200 times the number of U.S. dead. Ooh, it's bad. I actually didn't catch that chart when I was editing this video. Well, look at that really quick. Yeah. So, <sighs> Holy moly. A lot of dead. Jeez. But that's the, horrible. The military industrial complex just like wants to keep going. Yep. <laughs> and the yellow vest, ABC News, Australia violence return. ABC News, Australia. Violence returns to Paris, marking a year since yellow vest protesters began. Protests began. A year since the unrest erupted across the nation. The defiance and passion remain strong. We're telling French President Emmanuel Macron that we're here. We're still here. The yellow vests are not dead. This is in France, by the way, everybody. Just the yellow vests are in France. I like how we get no reporting in America about it. Even this is coming from ABC News Australia. (laughs) In the city centre, black-clad rioters focused their anger on old targets. Banks and shop fronts were smashed, cars overturned wow. and set alight, and barricades set up in anticipation of the police response. Riot police were quickly on the scene in numbers, using tear gas and water cannons and arresting dozens of people. There were more arrests in the south of the city as demonstrators tried to march to a major ring road for a sit-in. We've achieved almost nothing in a year, so we're now going to change tactics, as we need to do more than just stage weekly demonstrations. What, well, more than just weekly demonstrations? What, well. What what tactics are they going to do? The Yellow Vest's ranks have thinned from its peak late last year of half a million people. But widespread anger remains at the rising cost of living and the government's failure to offer economic relief. The protesters are calling for a national strike in early December and have vowed to step up the pressure. 
And let's be fair, they originally started because all the carbon tax crap going on. And French French government had to pull that back a little bit because things were getting a little heated. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. And they sure could use some better weapons. Yeah. Poor French. There. Yep, you know, but we're not getting that reporting here in the US because yeah. they don't want us protesting. They just want us riding over sporting events. Yeah. CBSN, USC issues warning about drug use after ninth student death this semester. Police are investigating a possible drug connection to a number of student deaths at the University of Southern California. Nine students have died since the start of the semester, six of whom are suspected overdoses. School officials are doubling down on education and outreach, issuing a warning to the community about the dangers posed by drugs. What? <laughs> yeah. Causes of death, LA Times reporter Colleen Shelby. There's been three confirmed suicides at this point. There's been nine total deaths, and at least six of those are still under investigation right now. So the most recent development that came out this week was that LAPD and USC are looking into the possibility of drug overdoses or possible tainted drugs as um, a factor in some of these deaths. So USC told me that in any given year, there's between four to 15 student deaths um, last year, there were six student deaths on campus. So while nine is not an unprecedented number, nine in the span of three months is exceptionally jarring. And that's why there is so much concern and a call for questions and answers right now. It's, it's weird that they, where did the drugs come into? Because they mentioned suicides. Yeah. But. Yeah. It's very, <laughs> very weird report. And yeah. here's the response from USC. That message came out late night Tuesday to students warning against opioid use, warning against mixing drugs with other substances. And they've doubled down on making sure that students are aware that there are mental health resources available on campus, since at this point there seem to be two different scenarios that have factored into these drugs, or excuse me, these drug-related deaths. Very strange. Yeah, I definitely want to yeah, more, hear more about that. I'm more is developing. Yes. Yeah. Because they talked about fentanyl in this, which is interesting. It's a lot. There's, I... Well, it's funny, too, because you mentioned how, you know, they've been cracking down on the fraternities. But... Yeah. I mean, now, yeah, the fraternities na nationwide have less deaths than USC yeah. has just in three months. So it's, yeah, it, I... yeah, there's something going on. Kids should not be dying at school. Yeah. Ready? Yep. NBC LA with a homeless update. Keep your eye on the woman walking out of this apartment building. A homeless man approaches and suddenly smacks her in the oh head. Oh my gosh. There are now thousands of crimes a year like this one in which the suspects are homeless and in many cases suffering from mental illness or substance abuse. It's so traumatic. <laughs> Heidi Van Tassel was walking to her car near Hollywood's Walk of Fame when, according to police and court records, a transient with schizophrenia and psychotic disorders dumped feces all over her. A bucket of his diarrhea. It was uh, liquid, ugh, hot liquid. Oh. I was soaked and I couldn't see it was coming off oh. of my eyelashes. Yeah, that's disgusting. That is horrible. That's bad into my eyes. Oh. Paramedics rushed her to the hospital and she now needs to be tested for infectious diseases every three months. That That's something horrible. I won't ever forget. It was, I mean, it was disgusting. For over a year, the I-Team has been reporting on crimes where the suspect... NBC4 I-Team, it's their special team. I don't know. I think it stands for investigative <laughs> team, I'm assuming. That's what yeah. the I stands for. They just don't want to say I it. I-Team. I... It's much homeless. sexier. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like this guy arrested for setting fire to chairs at a downtown oh steakhouse. My gosh. Yeah, what the hell? He's just sending the chairs are on fire. He's what the hell is going on in LA? This is ridiculous. And this homeless man pushing someone in front of a truck. Oh, yeah, there we were more than yeah, we had that one. Or that oh. one. That's a bad one. Watching that 6, again, though. 6,000 of these reported crimes in L.A. in 2017. By the end of 2018, the number of crimes was up more than 50%. And now we've learned the numbers are on track to climb even higher this year. That's not shocking. Yeah. It's just the tracking getting better, dude. 
We found case after case where the suspects suffer from mental illness or methamphetamine abuse. Meth use has been linked to violence and so is untreated mental illness. How could you live in this kind of environment and be okay? You mean right? mentally okay? Mentally okay. Reverend Andy Bales runs the Union Rescue Mission. Does life on the streets lead to violent behavior? Absolutely. Like the attack on that woman on a downtown L.A. street. Keep watching. Just seconds later, the man punched oh another... My God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, if you're watching the audio podcast, you might want to yeah. check out our YouTube. YouTube channel, healthytalkshow.com slash YouTube. Victim, attorney Brandon Cohen. Were you kind of in shock when it happened? What was shocking was that I lived here for four years and it didn't happen sooner. <laughs> we found the homeless who are arrested for these crimes are often right back on the streets without getting any treatment or help. I am always on the lookout. We discovered that Brandon Cohen's attacker, Charles Fuller, had four previous felony convictions. Jeez. But after he attacked Cohen, the cops simply gave him a citation for battery and let him go. Four months later, a block away, a similar attack against this mother and daughter. Though the police didn't make an arrest, so the suspect wasn't identified. Damn. It's insane. Yeah. Something has to Wait. be done. But Don't know what. We'll keep watching the Texas situation. Yep. And this report had an interesting missing persons in it. So let's watch this real quick. Nobody took it. Like Jose Rio Frio, who made headlines in New York for stalking a TV anchor. He moved to L.A., where he what? was convicted of threatening to kill a security guard. Mm -hmm. how, how did he even get to L.A.? Oh, that on. is so impressive. Yeah. And did they pay him to go to L.A.? Maybe. They shipped him. Last May, he wandered away from this psychiatric facility and has since been on the LAPD's missing persons list. Crap, he's been on the missing persons list. Guess case closed. Don't know where he's at. But the I-team found him hiding in plain sight, wow. sitting day after day, I'm not married. yelling at people ah. from this Hollywood bus bench. Right no one looked very hard. Mental health issues. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what the hell is LAPD? What are they doing? They're not looking hard at all. Obviously not. What is going on? Didn't, didn't us, take the I team very long. Yeah. Ask LDTalkShow.com if you live in LA or the LA area. You want to let us know. Give us a report, please. We don't live down there anymore. <laughs> you can see why we, we left. <laughs> yeah. Moving on to oat milk, specifically Oatly. CNBC, how Oatly built a $100 million oat milk empire. It seems like these days, if it grows from the ground, someone will try to milk it. Plant-based milks from almond to soy are big business. From August 2018 through August 2019, total sales of plant-based milks were about $1.8 billion. It's safe to say plant-based beverages have moved from the fringe to mainstream. But of all the brands to come to market, Oatly is an outlier. When the Swedish company's American supply of barista blend oat milk ran dry in 2018, it started an online bidding war. A case of 12 packs of Oatly that sells today for around $50 was selling for over $200 oh. on Amazon. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. And think of that. If you were the company being able to manufacture it, shortages and then sell for 200 bucks if they could somehow get more money for what they're making yeah oh, oh that'd be great i don't know if they did that brief history oat milk was developed in the 1990s by ricard oste who was working as a food scientist at lund university in sweden oste studied under professor arn dolkvist known for discovering the underlying factors to lactose intolerance in 1963. our founders just figured like, okay, if a vast majority of the world population are intolerant to milk, why don't we make something that is actually designed for human beings? The vast majority of the population is intolerant to milk. That's, that's what the statistics usually say. Interesting. Yeah. I, Americans are allegedly the outliers and that we can keep drinking milk like well into adulthood. Oh, interesting. Yeah not baby cows and they look like all over the place but they found the solution right in front of the nose which is like oats ricard and his brother bjorn patented the invention and founded oatly in 1994 but it would take 20 years for oat milk 
to finally gain traction. Takes a long time. Yeah, I never heard of oat milk until recently. Yeah, the rise of Oatly. Talk about the rise of Oatly is to look at the downfall of dairy Uh. milk. Since 2015, cow's milk sales have dropped by about $3.4 billion. But it's still in first place. By a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. That's an impressive chart there. (laughs) But we did talk about how it is hurting the industry. Oh, yeah. Our last episode. (laughs) Total sales of cow's milk in the U.S. from August 2018 through August 2019 were about $12 billion. Sales of oat milk during that same time period were just $40 million. Experts say only 1 in 10 consumers use a milk alternative, and only 16% of those consumers use oat milk. So it's still a very small portion of of the population that uses oat milk, but it's quickly rising. Consumer trends are in Oatly's favor. We know that Oatly came to the market in 2016, and certainly with the cult following that it's that it's grown within the coffee community. We saw that in about... I want an 20- Oatly lab coat. I know, they look really cool. <laughs> All the little things they have. I've never seen any of the little Oatly magnets or anything. Dang. Some of that stuff. So it's 2017, 2018, but really over the past year, it's really grown. Nielsen data shows that from 2018 to 2019, sales of oat milk in the U.S. skyrocketed from $6 million to close to $40 million in sales. So that's reflecting a 500% increase in dollar sales. In one year? Which is really impressive. Yeah. Uh, Oatly generated over $100 million in sales in 2018. And we're going to double that this year. Mm-hmm. And we expect to that to be doubled the year after that too, you know. It's truly an exponential curve. They're just killing it. Are other milk alternatives suffering though? To oat milk? I have no idea. This report doesn't cover that. Yeah. We'll look, we'll check into it. Yes, we will. And then the last clip, how Oatly infiltrated the U.S. market. Because I'm wondering, how do you get that much? Yeah. They just introduced they, in, what, 2016, and now they're becoming dominant players. And how'd they do it? Oatly's introduction to U.S. customers in 2017 was unique, to say the least. Oatly's U.S. general manager, Mike Messersmith, said, getting people to try a new brand let alone a product they've never heard of before, is almost impossible. So rather than enter the U.S. market through a large grocery chain or beverage distributor, Oatly sent representatives to introduce the product in person at high-end coffee oh my shops gosh. around New York City. We wanted to try to think of... Absolutely genius. This give is, it to, give this it to the hipsters. starting to make so much give sense Give it to right the hipsters. Of what would be that ideal first experience? Um, for someone to be able to try the product for the first time. And for us, we thought about especially coffee shops and tea shops, where if you were able to uh, take the recommendation of your local barista who you see every day and try our product through an expertly prepared latte or cappuccino, Mm. that would be a really amazing way to kind of be introduced to even just the idea of oat milk. The gamble paid off. I always make jokes that it's like oat o'clock because it seems like it comes in waves. Apparently, World travels fast in the coffee community, especially when there's a hot new product with extremely limited supply. When I started working here, um, our distributor would only give us about nine cases of Oatly a week. There was a time when we were like seriously running out and really had to be careful. I remember that. Yeah, the great oat milk shortage. Yeah. Oh yeah. And business coffee shops would advertise, we have oat milk in stock. I remember that. On Instagram and stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm how we were using it and like to not waste too much when steaming or like putting it out. But nowadays I think that the great Oatly shortage of 2019 is over. Oatly was introduced to the U.S. in late 2016 via one exclusive coffee partner. Oh, I know them. Intelligentsia. Intelligentsia, oh yeah. Very good coffee. High end. In January 2017, it expanded to other shops. And by the end of that year, it was served in about 650 locations. Oh, yeah. As of October 2019, Oatly is available in about 7,000 shops and 5,000 grocery stores in the United States. That is absolutely genius. Absolute genius. That's how we found out about it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, local I was, hipster coffee shop. I was shops. at my local hipster coffee shop, mm-hmm. and they said, would you like to try oat milk? I said, what's oat milk? I usually drink almond milk. Oh, no, no, try this oat milk. Or I drink hemp milk. That's what I usually was asking for is the hemp milk. Yeah, if they have. Throw the the oat milk. Yeah, Yeah. oat milk is really good. Oat milk is tasty. It's really good. It gets our seal of approval so far. It's the best. It's true. Yeah. 
and now they're trying to enter China as a market. That's just a little tidbit. Good luck. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a lot of consumers over there. But I think milk, as far as dairy, they need to strike back because this alternative is not milk. Almond milk, no, no. It's almond juice, oat <laughs> juice. It's hemp juice, coconut juice. <laughs> it's not coconut milk. When did we start calling it coconut milk? We, because we, it's, it's I, running against the dairy I farm. I always get a little disturbed when they say milk, like the almond yeah, or the oat. No, not, just the, blend it. it. Yeah. It's milk. It's not milk. It's not. It's not milk. Milk has to come from a mammal. That, that's true. That is a definition of milk. Yes. You are absolutely you. correct. It's juice. So yeah. we need to call it oat juice. So I don't know. Can we sue them for... Can we sue, can we sue all these... Oh, all these fake milk companies? Can I don't the think dairy we farmers can. can. Maybe the dairy farmers maybe. can. Maybe. I wish we could. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Oat milk <laughs> is, though, uh, pretty good for the environment, at least compared to other yeah, milks. Yeah, that's actually... A good point because they, we were looking at this still. Yeah, right they here. had a nice sustainability system. report that Oatly. Re- this is part of their push to the U.S. market, and they release all this cool color. It's just really it's a lot to read. But yeah, it's supposed to be more environmentally friendly and all o- this good of stuff. Of course, they did fund the study that kind of proved that. So yeah. I don't know if I would take their numbers completely at face value because they say like, oh, it uses eighty percent less land and milk but yeah. i was also thinking about almond milk because that's a lot of water in, in farming those trees which almond people don't juice, talk about I mean, almond oh juice. sorry almond we're juice we're starting this new campaign it's we're but, i'm gonna start no more it's all juice <laughs> new rule but new rule when you look at how juice. oat juice is made mm-hmm. they they grow the oats mm-hmm. and then they just juice blend them. them yeah well they blend them with an enzyme and water so all yeah. the water that's used is what you drink basically so I, I'm okay with the fish and water yeah, usage. That's perfect. Yeah. Water's yeah. good. That doesn't I, sound so bad. I will bad. say our good old friend hemp milk, that's also extremely good for you. And I think it's more nutrient rich. Is than it oat better milk. for the environment though? That's the question. I, I think they're both are really good for the environment. Perfect. Yeah. I but, I'm not sure that I could say one is better than the other for the environment. Awesome. Cool. Both both better than almond. <laughs> Almond milk sucks. Yeah, it's the it tastes. Way. No, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, soy milk. Soy juice sucks. Soy, soy juice sucks. Um, almond juice is a close second to sucking. Yeah. Because almond juice also sucks. You but know that. Soy juice really sucks. I don't, people who drink soy juice, there's something wrong with you because that stuff tastes like crap. <laughs> it's true. The pea stuff tastes good. Yeah, pea juice is fantastic. It's freaking expensive. It's super expensive. And it, there's no way pea juice is friendly <laughs> to the environment. I do not. That. That's a stretch. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think I read it was decent, but I think oat and hemp are still better. Just oat juice and hemp juice. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and what about coconut juice? <laughs> you know, I yeah. don't know about coconut juice. Yeah, we'll find out. All right, coconuts. So where are they grown? You have to think about the carbon footprint of transporting yeah. them. Oats we make How's in America. It's so cheap. How's coconut juice so damn cheap? <laughs> I don't know. We gotta research this. Ah, so many questions. I All know. right, let's log out. We record Healthy Talk Show live on Mondays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at 3 a.m. UTC over at HealthyTalkShow.com forward slash live. Please help financially produce the show by heading over to HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. Your financial contribution will ensure we remain unbiased, commercial free, and will help us pay for things like rent. Our show is value for value. If you found value in this show, please provide value back by visiting HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. Another way to provide value is feedback. Our email is ask at healthytalkshow.com. Our phone number 509-878-3229. And healthytalkshow.com for all of our social media links. Love and light. Love and light.